bless your prayer by the end of the year this year. Hopefully right now, actually. But 216, let's turn over to 216 together. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. I'm dwelling in Beulah land. Let's all stand together as we sing. 216, on that verse together. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth be set on every hand. Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of this shall move me from see you back in church tonight and uh, had a wonderful morning this morning and uh, we're ready to go in 2016 amen, amen. and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight thanks for being in church on Sunday evening let's pray together shall we <coughs> father we bow before you in prayer tonight and we thank you Lord for another opportunity for us to be together here in the house of God and thank you Lord for each one that's made their way here tonight we pray for those who are unable with us tonight because they're ill. Lord, I pray that your healing hand be upon them, Lord, and raise them up that they can be back with us very soon. Yes. Lord, we do pray that as we bow before you here at the beginning of the service, that you'll make this service what we need it to be. You know what we need. You know, Lord, what the need of our hearts are. And I pray, Lord, that you would help this service to meet those needs. Bless the music. Bless the preaching of the Word of God and our fellowship together tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Okay, you may be seated. Would you turn with me to number 334 in your hymnal? 334. To Jesus' day, every day I find my heart is closer drawn. Still sweeter every day. On that verse, let's sing it all together. To Jesus every day I find my heart is closer drawn. He's fairer than the glory of the golden.
singing tonight. All right, some announcements now for us. Listen carefully, if you would. Uh, Wednesday night for the midweek service, 7 o'clock right here. The uh, children's clubs will be meeting again on Wednesday night and uh, everything back in gear for the new year. And uh, looking forward to a good service together Wednesday evening. Um, Thursday night, of course, down at the RU Inside, down at the prison. Friday night with RU right here. And uh, Saturday morning for our soul winning bus visitation, of course, at uh, 10 o'clock. And uh, the RU's out at London at 8.30. Saturday night, 5 o'clock, will be the workers' dinner. I uh, want you to make sure you're present for that. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful evening, all right? And uh, if you haven't signed up, get on the list, okay? I looked at it again today after church. There's some of you that are not on there that ought to be on there, okay? All right? So uh, don't make me call you, okay, and uh, <laughs> say you're coming, all right? Get on that list. It's volunteer be drafted, I guess, so uh, be a volunteer, amen? And you'll enjoy it when uh, we need you, and uh, every... Every member ought to be serving somewhere. And uh, so get involved and uh, you'll be happy and uh, you'll enjoy the dinner and the meeting on Saturday evening. That's 5 o'clock and we have something for the, we have a nursery that will be uh, cared for. We also have the children, the school age children. John and Emily are here tonight and they agreed that they're going to run a program for them. And uh, that's going to be exciting. And uh, so it'll be a great night on Saturday night as we have our workers dinner and our workers meeting. Okay, sign up down the foyer, put your name on the sheet. I think it's just a drink or dessert. Uh, we're providing the meal uh, for you on Saturday evening. So uh, come on out and be part of that and see where the Lord would have you be involved in serving him. Okay, and that'll take us right in next Sunday. I did want to mention the uh, Grove City School of the Bible. Uh, Brother Morton, I think, said something about that last week. And uh, uh, several of you were at the meeting on Sunday night. Uh, that's due to start now January 19th. Okay, and we're ready to order... The material, what do you need, Brother Morland? You need people's money? Oh, yeah. yeah, pretty much. Because <laughs> we need to order the material. Right? I'm sorry? Okay, all right. Pay for the schooling. I see, okay. And um, they need to, depending on what courses they're going to take, do you have that information or do they need to give you that information? Okay, so your meeting last Sunday night, you didn't give them anything, to, applications or anything like that? You did? I did. I'm still just trying to get a few more that I signed before. Okay. All right. If you have not filled out the application and you want to be in those classes and want to attend that, again, that's a great Bible education. You get a certificate at the end of two years, a Bible certificate, and you can either uh, have a diploma mailed to you here, or you can go down to Crown College in Powell, Tennessee and march in their graduation ceremonies and get presented uh, by the president of the college there. Uh, but it's a, it's a great, great opportunity uh, to learn the Bible and to be better equipped to be able to serve the Lord and uh, to be used by Him. So uh, that'll be Tuesday evening starting January 19th, but we need to get on it and uh, get the material ordered so we can get here. Uh, you have a nice notebook that will come with every course uh, with the notes in it and such that will uh, be a help to you that you'll have forever and you'll be able to keep. So uh, if you haven't filled out the application, if you have and you know what course you're going to take, and you can uh, let Brother Moreland know, even if you don't have the money tonight, tell him when you'll have the money in and uh, get that uh, information to him so we can get, uh, get that ordered uh, so we can be here for sure on the 19th when we begin. Okay? All right. Uh, let's take a moment. Anybody visiting this evening? Looking to see if we got anybody. I think it's just us tonight. And uh, is that right? Am I missing anybody? Okay. Let's hear from the choir then. <coughs>
Emma Jean out sing you. Let's sing that last together with your whole heart. I will never have a fear, for my Lord is ever near, and in Him no open eye can lie. He's the keeper of my soul, since I gave Him full control, and He claims me out of the
He is supplying a plenteous grace. He bestows. Let's sing that last together. Every need is supplying plenteous grace. He bestows. Every day my way is brighter the longer I serve Him. The sweeter He grows. The longer I serve Him. without the instruments all together. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more I love him, more love he bestows. He stands like heaven, my heart overflows. Seated. Ushers will come and get our offering tonight. This sounds way low, Brother Dean. I don't know what happened, but I noticed that the second time Bob got up. Well, Brother Moreland said, if you will meet with him, if you're going to be in the class and uh, you want to, you're interested in that, meet him down in the conference room after service. He'll make sure he has applications and uh, get that filled out. If you want to talk to him about uh, when you'll be able to get the money in for the classes, talk to him about that. Uh, any questions at all or any, any interest at all, make sure you meet him in the conference room after the service tonight, okay? Let's pray and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering this evening. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this uh, great opportunity that we have to come and open your word. Lord, may we be uh, respectful of it. Lord, may we be uh, attentive to it. Lord, and, uh, Lord, may we be willing to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us as your word is taught. And Father, may we get a blessing from it, and may we uh, ask each one individually, ourselves, Lord, uh, what do I need tonight that will help me to grow and go to higher ground? Put me on a higher plane, Father, than I was when I came. And Father, we'll give you all the thanks and praise for it. Bless the offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Please take your Bibles this evening for our scripture reading. 1 Kings chapter 19, please. 1 Kings <clears throat> and chapter 19. First Kings 19, please. We're going to read the first eight verses of First Kings chapter 19. I'll begin together on one, you join me on two, and we'll read alternately until we end together on verse number eight of First Kings 19. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, <clears throat> which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and opportunity we have to open up your precious word tonight. And God, we were asking you to make our hearts open and ready to receive the truth that you have for us this evening. God, I pray that each of us would do our best to focus and concentrate, that we hear the still small voice of God. I pray you'll bless the special now and may it prepare our hearts to be ready to receive your word. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. Precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour empty that that shouldest fill me a clean vessel in thy hand with no power but as thou givest graciously with each command witnessing thy power to save me setting free from self and sin thou who bought is to possess me in thy fullness lord come in channels only blessed master but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us thou canst use us every day and every Jesus, fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know, that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow. Channels only, blessed Master, but 
God with all thy wondrous power, flowing through what thou canst use us every day and every hour, flowing through what thou canst use us every day and every hour. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you now as we come to the preaching of the Word of God. And Lord, I'm praying that you'll give me your help as I bring this message this evening. And please help the folks as they listen. Lord, I believe this is a message that could help many that are here tonight. And not only on a personal level, but in our circle of influence level. For we all know somebody or have dealt with someone or we have dealt with in our own life. Struggling with the matter of depression. And I pray, Lord, that you'd give us help from your word and that your word would have final authority in our life. That, Lord, we would uh, not so easily and readily take the words of man and so reluctantly listen to the word of God. But I pray that we would readily and heartily accept the words of God and be reluctant to take the words of man. So, Father, speak to us this evening and help me to say things that ought to be said and to leave unsaid things that don't need to be said. But I pray that through your word tonight and through the principles we'll look at, you'll give help to your people. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The psychiatry students were in their college class when their professor began a discussion to prove a point. He said, what we're going to talk about today is the emotional extremes that mentally disturbed people go through. For example, he looked at one young lady in the class and said, what's the opposite of joy? And the girl looked at him and said, I suppose it's sadness. And he looked at another young lady and said, in the opposite of depression? And the young lady said, elation. And then he turned to a young man and he said, what about the opposite of woe? Well, the young man, Brother Jarvis, happened to be from Texas. And he said, well, I suppose the opposite of woe would be giddy up. <laughs> I don't know if that's mentally disturbed or not, but uh, they were talking about depression. According to psychiatrists at the Frank Minrith and Meyer Clinics, the majority of Americans suffer from a serious clinical depression at some point in their life. Most of the people never get any help for it. They just fight the battle on their own. You've seen the advertisements probably, and you, obviously you've seen them on television. I read one and pulled it from the Reader's Digest for Paxil. P-A-X-I-L, an antidepressant. The ad started with these words, depressed mood, loss of interest, sleep problems, difficulty concentrating, agitation, restlessness. And it concluded with these words, life's too precious to let another day go by feeling not quite yourself. And if you've experienced these, some of these symptoms nearly every day, for at least two weeks, a chemical imbalance may be to blame. And life can feel difficult all day. And you read that, uh, not just that ad, but ads like that ad. And you're likely to come to the conclusion that most, if not all, that suffer from any kind of depression are victims of a chemical imbalance. In fact, that's usually the understand modern psychiatry and really modern medicine, their holy grail is to find a pill that you can take to help you. The average American now in their medicine cabinet at home has 18 prescription and non-prescription pills that they take. Many of you know Older people, I mean, and, and they get in their 60s and 70s or 80s and they have to actually, they sell pill boxes with the days of the week on it. You can pile all your pills in so you make sure you get everything straight. Yeah. 
But all the psychiatrists and doctors want to do is try to find that magic potion that will correct the imbalance and try to give people relief from their dark moments and their sadness. But the truth is, depression is a real part of life for many people. You know, it's not something that everybody likes to talk about. Not something is a topic of discussion when there's family get-togethers. And certainly not a topic of discussion when you come to church. And so, but I do want you to understand it's a real part of people's lives. I, I, I read this, I was interesting, several years ago, and I've, I was at this church for a wedding several years ago. It's a Southeast Christian church in Louisville, Kentucky. It's a big church, and they were at a Wednesday night service where they had about 700 people there on a Wednesday evening, and this is what they said. They, they asked for people to come forward, and they would have the pastors lay hands on them and pray for their healing. The speaker pointed out that there was a lot of hurt in the room, sickness, broken relationships, etc. And he said the invitation that the pastors would be at the aisleways and, and you could come down and they would have prayer with you. He said the invitation that people begin to trickle down and some begin to make their way down from the balcony and such, and some individually, some in pairs. But before long, the trickle became a torrent of people. One of the pastors said he was not prepared for the response to the invitation. He said, I was totally surprised by the magnitude of it. Another one of the pastors in another aisle said I didn't, he did not expect the vast response either, nor did he anticipate the type of prayer needs revealed. He said at least two out of every three people ask for prayer for depression. I thought it would be more for physical needs, he said. But so many said, I feel depressed. I feel unworthy. I see no future. I was amazed at how many felt unworthy. I mentioned the Minrith Meyer clinics, and I think they've, they've merged now with some other clinics. But there's 25 of them in the United States. They're based in Dallas, Texas. In an average week, 50,000 people visit their clinics for therapy. And 75% of those, according to Dr. Meyer, will have either clinical depression or some kind of anxiety disorder. That's incredible. Depression can be a very real problem. But here's what's interesting. What's interesting is God gives us a case study in depression right in the Bible. And we read about it in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah experienced some of the classic symptoms of depression. Fear. Notice in verse number 3, when he, heard, when he saw that or he heard what Jezebel said, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. He's, he's running away in fear of Jezebel. Suicidal tendencies. Look at verse 4. He himself went a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might what? Die. Suicidal thoughts. It's enough now, Lord. Take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. He was very tired. Look at verse 5. He lay and slept under a juniper tree. He went down and slept. He was, he was tired from his journey. He slept for a while. We don't, it doesn't say how long till the angel touched him. You thought that touch by an angel was just in a, a TV show. Elijah was touched by an angel long before that came along. And said to him, arise and eat. And of course, he, he got up and, and ate. But he had a lot of feelings of rejection. Look at verse 10. I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. In other words, I, they've killed everybody else, I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Rejected. And by the way, he went through this, if you read this passage, for about two months. This wasn't just a couple nights. This wasn't just a 24-hour struggle. 
It was about a two-month experience that he wrestled with this depression. What's really bizarre about it is chapter 18. Uh, Elijah just came off Mount Carmel. He just came off one of the greatest victories and one of the most amazing things that you read about in the Bible. Where, where it was the, the, the epic battle on, on top of the mountain where, where the God who answers by fire is going to be the God. Remember, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And they had the epic battle. And listen, He gave them all day to try to get Baal, the fire God, to send fire down from heaven. It should have been a piece of cake. He's the fire God. That shouldn't have been a problem. The sun's beating down on everything. And of course, they got nothing. Elijah simply put all together. Remember, then he soaked everything with water. And then he prayed a simple prayer. And boy, God sent the fire down. And then Elijah took his sword and he went and hacked up 450 prophets of Baal by himself. Amazing, amazing day, amazing victory. Then he went to pray. You remember he's praying for rain. They had not had rain for three and a half years. And he prays, remember, and servant goes, servant goes away, he comes back, says nothing. He keeps praying, goes away, comes back, nothing. And finally the seventh time he comes back and he says, I see a cloud about the size of a man's fist. Elijah said, saddle up the horses, we better get out of here. And sure enough, that cloud came in and boy, it began to rain. Wow, what a victory. What a tremendous, tremendous, mount, uh, really a mountaintop experience that he had. Unbelievable things. And you think, why, why would he run away to a desolate corner of the earth and wish to die after such a great victory like that? And we don't know the reason. The Bible doesn't say. You say, well, I wish we had an answer to that. We don't have an answer to that other than this. That even the most dynamic, wonderful servants of God can struggle with depression. Don't, don't think that, that you're immune to it. It's not necessarily, listen, it's not necessarily a lack of faith. It's not necessarily an indication that there's immorality or wickedness in your life. Don't, don't, don't jump to that conclusion. Elijah was the man of God of his day. And he is so far down in the depths of despair, even looking up seems wrong to him. He's, he's totally confused. Now here's the, the thing to notice. God didn't leave him that way. God didn't leave him that way. He didn't say, well, Elijah, you know what? What you have here is a chemical imbalance and Paxil hasn't been invented yet, so too bad. Tough, tough, tough for you. He didn't say that. Long before psychiatry was ever thought of, long before healing could ever be bought in a purple pill, long before we had any clinics or psychiatrists or psychologists, long before all of that, God healed a man of depression and he gave us a record of it in the Bible. And what God did for Elijah in 1 Kings 19, God can do for you and God can do for me. God can still do that for people today. Now what did God do to help Elijah to heal? I want you to notice that God recognized that Elijah's problem or his depression was not an imaginary problem. Would you turn that on low for me please? Guys in the front row, sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. The, it wasn't uh, his depression. God, God understood Elijah's depression was real. Not imaginary, not made up. Tangible. God didn't come to Elijah and say, Get a hold of yourself. What's wrong with you? Come on. Chin up, buddy. Get with it. What's, what's, what's your faith? God never treated Elijah roughly at all. In fact, in answer to Elijah's prayer to die, God just let him sleep. There are, there are some prayers you better be glad God doesn't answer. That was one of them. The angel comes and gives him something to eat and then lets him sleep some more. And then he lets him go down to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, God doesn't say a word. 
amazing thing. He, God doesn't offer any counsel. He doesn't set Elijah down and say, now let's have a face-to-face. We've got to have a confrontation about this. He just left Elijah alone. He gives Elijah time to rest and to think. I read this week in preparing for this message, and really two weeks ago, I was going to preach this last Sunday night, about a pastor who said, and he was writing about his experience of, I think it was about 25 years ago, one of his nephews, his sister's son, died in a fire. He said his mother was home alone when she got the phone call to tell her the news. And when she was alone, as she heard the news, he said something inside of her snapped. He said when his dad got home, he found her in somewhat disoriented and really in a state of shock. (coughs) Excuse me. The next day, he said I had a conversation with her and she would say, David's dead? And the preacher related, I would say to her, yes, mom, David's dead. Then she'd talk for a while and we'd have what seemed to be a normal conversation. He said then her eyes would glass over. And she'd say to me again, David's dead? And I'd say, yes, Mom, David's dead. He said that would repeat itself over and over (coughs) and over again. It's difficult. He talked about how difficult it was to see a loved one struggle like that. The doctors advised his dad that his mom needed to be put in the hospital for a while. The dad was wise enough to say, if I do that, I'll never get her back. And he would not do that. But for the next few days, he said, dad never left her side. He waited on her. He held her. He spoke kindly to her. No probing questions. No pink pills. No nurses in white. Just rest and love. And in time, she recovered and dealt with her grief. That's in essence what God did with Elijah. No sermons, no long counseling sessions, just love and rest. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't eventually deal with his depression because he did. And I'm going to give you the four things that, that, that he did to help Elijah defeat his depression. It may surprise you, they're not... They're not complicated they might be rather simplistic but I think you'll see that it worked for in what God does and if God said it and God used it it'll work the first thing I want you to notice that he did was he sent Elijah to church notice what he said he went unto in verse 8 he went unto Mount Horeb or Horeb the Mount of God Horeb is where is, is, is also Mount Sinai. It's the place where the law was given. It's the place where God met with Moses. Did you know one of the best places to deal with depression is church? You know one of the greatest places that will help you with depression is church? That's why when you feel depressed and you feel down, where's the last place you want to go? Church. But it is the place you need to go. And the place you need to be. When church is right and church is done right, it's the place to where we bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's where we exhort one another, we encourage one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. It's interesting, in 1999, Duke University conducted a study of nearly 4,000 older adults. And here's their conclusion. Attendance at a house of worship is related to lower rates of depression and anxiety. But church doesn't stop with just being a house of worship. Time alone with God in prayer and Bible study also proved to be a powerful antidepressant. Always when someone comes in with a difficulty, with a problem, I know Brother Bob has done this with our youth students. They come in and they say they're struggling with this or that. He always says, are you in your Bible? Are you doing your journal? Are you spending time with God? Similar. Not exactly probably the questions, but that's, that's what he gets at. And you know what? In every case where somebody's struggling, you know what the answers of those are? No. No. 
Not, listen, not reading things about the Bible, not reading things about God, not reading things, no, reading His Word, writing down what He speaks to your heart about, and then talking to Him. It's important. You spending time with God. It's a powerful antidepressant. On Andrew Newberg, who's director of clinical nuclear medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, he studied the brains of religious individuals who either prayed or meditated. And his team of doctors found a dramatic increase in action in the front region of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. That region is associated with judgment and empathy. And they also discovered that folks who spent time in prayer and meditation, they, they discovered a decrease in activity in the region of the brain. Notice the uh, periodal, is that right? Periodal? Parietal, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. I, uh, parietal lobe, which gives us our sense of self. Our sense of self. So it indicates that, listen, people while engaged in spiritual pursuits felt a loss of self. Newberg says prayer and meditation have been shown to lower the risk of depression and heart disease and improve immune function. Isn't that amazing? So when we talk about, listen, don't think about yourself, die to self and get busy doing something for someone else. Listen, that's not just just Bible speaking, though that would be enough. It's clinically proven that that's right. And once again, science and medicine finally catches up to the Bible. That's how that works. So God sent Elijah to church. The second thing God did was, God had Elijah tell him what the problem was. God had Elijah tell him what the problem was. Look at verse 13. It was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the inner end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Okay, Elijah, what are you doing here? And you notice, if you know the passage, God didn't just ask it once, He asked it twice. What are you doing here? Let me ask you a question. Did God know? Sure. Why did He ask Elijah? He wanted Elijah to say it. He wanted to hear what Elijah had to say. He, had, he knew what Elijah, where he was and he knew why he was there, but he wanted Elijah to vocalize what he thought was wrong in his life. Elijah needed to explain what he thought the problem was. And then, listen, once Elijah explained what he thought the problem was, here's the third thing God did. God began to deal with his false beliefs. The false ideas that were fueling Elijah's depression. We have a saying in in the RU that it comes from the Bible and it's only the truth makes free. And the truth is not something, it's someone, it's Jesus Christ. But listen, the truth makes you free. Well, why are you not free? Because false ideas and false thinking have put you in bondage. It's stinking thinking. False ideas about God. That verse in, the, in, in Corinthians about bringing in every thought into captivity and the obedience of Christ, casting down imaginations, and listen, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That little phrase, uh, as Brother Currington brings out, that little phrase about against the knowledge of God, that means we cast down any thought that we know is what we goes against what we know to be true about God. Anything you get comes into your head, a thought that comes that you know is not consistent with what you know is true about God, we cast it out. We don't even entertain it. We don't let it stay. We don't invite it in. You don't have a cup of coffee with it. You throw it out and say, I'm not even dwelling on that thought. That's flat out wrong. And I won't think about it. And so he begins to deal with those false ideas. Here's what Elijah was thinking. Here's what his problem was. Look at verse 14. I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, 
thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. He said, God, Israel's rejected you, and they've gone after other gods. They put your prophets to death. I'm the only one left. And what, I, what, Isaiah, what, what Elijah basically is saying there, Lord, I've done my best to serve you and be faithful to you and to do what you told me to do. And, and, and I'm doing all that I know to do and you aren't doing anything. In other words, I'm doing all this. What are you doing? That's what he was saying. You know what God told him? Look at verse 18. He said, Elijah, yet have I left me how many? How many church? 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him. God said, Elijah, I've not been doing nothing. I've been at work. I've been at work. In fact, I'm just getting started. <laughs> He tells them, here's what you're going to do. He tells them in verse 15, I want you to go and return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. Him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. And what he's, what's all that saying? You know what I think God's saying to Elijah? Elijah, you know what? I have been doing something and I am still doing something. I have everything under control. I've got Haziel ready to be king over Syria. I've got Jehu ready to be king over Israel. I've got Elisha ready to take your spot. He said, I've got it all set. What do you mean I've been doing nothing? A person in depression needs to realize that just like Elijah, God is at work in their life. Even though they don't think so. Even when they can't see Him. When a person's depressed they don't think God's doing much of anything. They don't understand because they're not seeing anything. No hope, no confidence. They don't see any God in anything. And that's when you have to cast out the thoughts that you know are not true about God. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that He who watches over us never slumbers and never sleeps. God never has to take a break. God is always at work, even when we can't see Him at work. God is always at work. So He got Elijah to church. He got him to tell him what was wrong. He corrected the false thinking and beliefs that Elijah had. And that's usually what's always behind depressed people is they have wrong thoughts. They have faulty thinking. And you have to get that thinking corrected. And then let me say this. Fourthly, God gave Elijah something to do. Isn't that interesting? God finished this counseling session with Elijah. Elijah was still in the complaining mood. But God basically told him, get back to work. God told him, I've got a job for you to do. Make yourself useful. The Lord said, go back the way you came. He said, you're going back to Damascus. You're going to anoint... Haziel to be king over Syria. You're going to take Jehu and make him king over Israel. You're going to anoint Elisha to be to succeed you as a prophet. He gave him something to do. To be useful. During a lecture on mental health, somebody asked Dr. Carl Menninger, what would you advise a person to do if that person felt a nervous breakdown coming on? Most people thought, well, surely this doctor will say, you need to go see a psychiatrist immediately. But he didn't say that. To almost everyone's astonishment in the room, Dr. Menninger replied, lock up your house, go across the railroad tracks, find somebody in need, and help that person. To overcome discouragement, don't focus on yourself. 
focus on helping somebody else. Psychiatrists and psychologists can give little pills that can do wonderful things for people who suffer from depression and anxiety. But for real healing, you can't beat God. God knows what He's talking about. I haven't... Now, let's back up for a minute. Back up to what we said God told Elijah to do. We said four things. He sent him to church. He had Elijah tell him what the problem was. He dealt with the false beliefs and the false ideas. And then he gave Elijah something to do. That's your formula for defeating depression. Now listen carefully. I've never had anybody in 33 years of pastoring who was faithful to church Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Listened to the preaching, applied the preaching of the Word of God. That, that and, and by the way, begin to serve others and be involved in ministry that we were giving to others that ever came into the office and said, Preacher, you've got to help me, I'm just depressed. Doing these things won't just defeat depression, it can prevent depression. You practice this and you give yourself to this and you won't have to battle depression because you're not thinking of yourself. That's really the root of depression. When we get to thinking again, there's false thoughts, false thinking. And you have to be willing to listen when God wants to correct your thinking. And God will. And He does that through His Word and through the preaching of God's Word. Let me, let me close with this this evening. During the first part of the 20th century, J.C. Penney was a man who presided over a very powerful empire of 1,700 stores. At the time, it was the largest chain of department stores in America, each one bearing his name. Though that enterprise made him incredibly wealthy, he was not devoid of setbacks and troubles. In fact, in 1929, events took place that nearly cost J.C. Penney his life. When the Great Depression struck, it came at a time of great financial vulnerability for Penny. In the good times before the Depression, he had overextended himself, borrowed heavily to finance many of his ventures. When the Depression hit, banks began to request repayment of his loans sooner than anticipated. Cash flow was tight and Penny found it very difficult to meet payment schedules. Constant and unrelenting worry began to take a toll. He said, I was so harassed with worries I couldn't sleep and I developed an extremely painful ailment. Concerned about his deteriorating health, he checked himself into Kellogg Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. Kind of the Mayo Clinic of its day. There, Dr. Elmer Eagleston a staff physician, examined Penny and declared that he was extremely ill. Penny later recalled a rigid treatment was prescribed, but nothing helped. I was constantly tormented by periods of hopelessness and despair. My very will to live was rapidly eroding. I got weaker by the day. I was broken nervously and physically. Filled with despair, unable to even see a ray of hope. I had nothing to live for. I felt that I hadn't found a friend. I hadn't had a friend left in the world. I felt even my family turned against me. Alarmed by this rapid deteriorating condition, Dr. Eagleston gave Penny a sedative. However, the effect wore off quickly, and Penny awakened with the conviction he was living the last night of his life. Getting out of bed, I sat down and wrote farewell letters to my wife and my son saying that I did not expect to live to see the dawn. But Penny awakened the next morning surprised to find himself alive. 
making his way down the hallway of the hospital, he could hear singing coming from a little chapel where devotional exercises were held each morning. The words of the hymn he heard being sung spoke deeply to him. And going into the chapel, he listened to the singing, the reading of the Scripture, and prayer. And he, said, he testifies this. He said, something happened to me that day. I can't explain it. I only call it a miracle. I felt as if I'd been instantly lifted out of the darkness of a dungeon into a warm, brilliant sunlight. I felt I'd been transported from hell to paradise. I felt the power of God as I had never felt it before. And in a life-transforming instant, Penny knew that God was there to help him. And from that day to this, he said, my life has been free from worry. The most dramatic And glorious 20 minutes of my life, he says, were spent in that chapel that morning. The words from the hymn that spoke so eloquently and miraculously to J.C. Penney were these. You know it. Be not dismayed, whate'er betide, God will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Father, take the truth this evening. And I pray it will be a help and a blessing to people here and to those who we know are struggling with depression. Thank you for including Elijah's struggle in the Bible so we could learn from it tonight. Thousands of years ago. Yet, Lord, your ways, your truth is unchanging. The way you dealt with Elijah and brought about cure of his depression is the way that you can cure depression of folks in this room tonight and you can help us to prevent depression. And Lord, I pray this evening that you'll free some that might be struggling with that discouragement and that depression. I pray they'll remember how you dealt with Elijah. And they'll look at their life and see how you're dealing with them. But Elijah listened to you, Lord, and he did what you told him to do. And I pray that each of these tonight would do what you're telling them to do. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'll finish our prayer in just a moment. wonder how many folks here this evening would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight. I, I needed the message that the Lord just spoke to my heart through 1 Kings 19. It doesn't matter if you're struggling with depression or discouragement. or Maybe you're dealing with someone who is and this is what you needed to be able to go to them and be a help. But I wonder how many believers here tonight would just say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight. I needed the message. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Would you put it up? God bless you. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. The place to start over, the place to begin anew is at the altar. Bow your knee to God. The first place he went was to the Mount of God, Mount Oreb. Go to the place where God is. Let him put his arms around you and love you and help you. Bring you to the place he wants you to be. Father, have your way now and your will in this invitation. Thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray that each one now will do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. You'll meet with us at these altars to see. Give us help as only you can give. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing the invitation. 
God will take care of you. You come while you sing. Be sentence. not dismayed, whatever right. betide. God will Amen. take care of you. Beneath his Amen. wings of love abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day. of toil when heart doth fail God will take care of you when dangers fierce your path assail God will take care of you God will take care of you through every day or all the way take care of you. All you may need, He will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. Sing it with them. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Look this way for a minute. I'm not, make sure I understand something. There, there are times that there are physical issues that need to be addressed. I'm not saying that never is the case. Certainly that is, but is it is not always the final answer. Uh, don't don't put your faith. It wasn't that uh, when when God judged Asa, it wasn't that Asa went to the physicians. It was that he went to the physicians before he went to God. Uh, nothing wrong with going to the doctor. Nothing wrong with seeking help physically for when you have a physical problem. But the first, the first source you go to is God. And you get his guidance and his wisdom. And do what God says. And, and he'll lead you. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul wouldn't have traveled with a physician if there's a problem with doctors. Uh, Luke, who wrote Luke and the book of Acts, was a physician. Okay, And so now don't, don't think that, oh, pastor said I don't need to go to a doctor. I can just you know, uh, follow these steps. No, I... Uh, I'm not a doctor and I haven't played one on TV, but um, let's make sure that let's make sure we're going to God first and make sure we're doing what God says we should do and not relying on a pill to take care of our problems and not looking to God at all to help us, okay? And uh, so, so just, just want to make that clear, all right? And uh, let's, let's move on in 2016, amen? amen. All right, let's, let's pray and then we'll sing our song of dismissal. Father, Thank you so much for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Thank you, Lord, for a church that loves you and loves the Word of God. Thank you for each one that's here this evening, and thank you for meeting with us and for speaking to our hearts. Now, Father, we go from this place desiring to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And so, Lord, we leave this place reminding ourselves that we're going to higher ground and that, Lord, we desire to be servants and we desire to... To, to not compare ourselves with each other and not to judge ourselves or to judge others, but know that one day you'll judge us. We die to ourself. We desire to have the right disposition. Lord, we desire to have the right expectation, and that is we want to be like Christ. Put us onto that, that level of living this week, that we would all consider what Christ would do in our situation, and we would follow his leading. And then, Lord, I pray that you'd help us uh, to keep our thoughts in line with the Word of God. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. We love you, Lord. We thank you for a wonderful day together. 
Dismiss us now with your care. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. If you want to see Brother Moreland, School of the Bible, stop by the conference room, please. If you haven't filled out that application, get that filled out, and uh, we can get that ball rolling, okay? Let's sing together. <clears throat> hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below it's the grandest thing to be a Christian it's the best thing I know God bless you you're dismissed